When we were constructing this conference, the one thing that I most uh, acutely felt was uh, the success of this conference depends on our ability to have a few regulatory or government or legislative voices with us to kind of share their point of view on the, on the very hard questions that we're posing today. Uh, and so it was with great joy that um, we were able to find two representatives from the Federal Trade Commission uh, to share with us kind of both what they've learned over the years in the roles that they're playing, but I think more intriguingly whether or not they uh, think that we have anything new to offer or whether the conversation um, should go in one direction or another. Um, so at the very end of the day, we'll wrap up uh, with a conversation up here between me and Commissioner Julie Brill of the Federal Trade Commission. Um, but for now, it's, it's my great pleasure to introduce Joseph Farrell. Joseph Farrell is the Director of the Bureau of Economics at the Federal Trade Commission. He's had this post since 2009. Um, he's, I think, an unusually good bridge to the panel we just had uh, because in his civilian life, uh, he's a professor of economics at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, and in that role has played a quite active uh, role in thinking about the economics of privacy from an academic point of view. Um, this, is, of course, is not his first stint in government. He's Deputy Assistant Attorney General for Economics with the Justice Department, Chief Economist at the Federal Communications Commission, uh, has basically been everywhere in government uh, where we think a lot about privacy. I guess he should be on uh, some senator's staff next and then we can uh, call it, uh, call it the, the whole ball of wax. Um, and so I think uh, it is a, it's with great pleasure uh, that I introduce Joe Farrell. Please join me in thanking him for attending. Thank you. Um, seem to have lost half the audience, um, but perhaps they're on their way back. Um, so when I saw the conference schedule, I realized that I would have two quandaries. Uh, and I do have them, and I haven't resolved them, and I'll do my best with them. One is uh, exactly how much economics are we talking about here? Economics is in the conference title. It's in my title. It's who I am. Uh, Presumably you're interested in economics. Not very many of you are by primary training professional economists. So I'm going to try to hit uh, an appropriate sweet spot in the middle there. Um, <clears throat> that's a small sweet spot, easily missed. Um, I will do my best on that. The other question is how much I was going to respond to, try to integrate with, uh, and resent being scooped by. Uh, previous speakers and the panel, because there's a sense in which uh, perhaps Alessandro's talk and certainly the panel that we just heard uh, are very close to the issues that I want to talk about. So um, with those context setting uh, uh, remarks, let me say how uh, pleased I am to be here uh, to have a chance to address you. Um, it is and I don't think anybody has yet mentioned this, uh, the one-year anniversary today of the release of the FTC's draft privacy framework. Um, and, uh, of course, as you all saw, uh, we, uh, we released a proposed settlement uh, with Facebook earlier this week. So it's an active time at the FTC for uh, privacy policy. Okay, um, so I should say before I go any further that uh, what I'm going to tell you is my views and my thoughts, um, not those of the commission or any commissioner. Uh, you will hear later from Julie Brill, who's uh, with us today. Uh, and um, I'm going to try to focus, as I say, on some of what economics can tell us about privacy policy. I'm not going to try to tell you everything I think about privacy policy. Um, although I can opine generally on privacy policy, and I probably will do some of that at the end if I have time. So the first point I wanted to make, and this was intended to be kind of a, 
uh, a simple warm-up context setting point, but I think given the tone of some of the discussion in the panel, it may actually be the most important thing that I say. Um, in the panel, uh, and I won't try to flag individual speakers, uh, there was the idea that we have to justify somehow why consumers might care about privacy. And that, I think, came out in two ways. One is some kind of burden of proof uh, idea or proving the harm. And the other is, at a policy level, um, how should we think about uh, what we might be giving up for privacy and should we uh, think of information flow as the greater good and so on and so on. And what is it that consumers really want and is it legitimate? And this was linked uh, by some people with economics, quote unquote with the idea that economics pushes us towards considering the quantifiable, the tangible, and the verifiable specific harms, for example, from a loss of privacy. Well, it's true that with its cost-benefit analysis hat on, economics is capable of behaving in that kind of way. When you're doing cost-benefit analysis, when there are unpriced uh, goods floating around, you try to figure out how much people value those and perhaps why. And uh, various clever and uh, sophisticated techniques have been worked out in cost-benefit analysis for trying to do that with, for example, the value of life. Um, and that's part of what economists do. But much more fundamentally, economists do the opposite of that. That kind of cost-benefit analysis is probably not in your first-year microeconomics textbook. What is in your first-year microeconomics textbook, and is part of the blood of every economist, is what's called consumer sovereignty. We don't ask, why do consumers like red widgets more than blue gadgets? We don't ask, why do consumers like this kind of car rather than that kind of car? In basic first-year micro, we say that's what they want. Let's think about how the system can give them what they want. Okay? And so the consumer sovereignty strand of economic thinking, which is much more fundamental, much more basic than the cost-benefit analysis strand, completely goes against the idea that economics says you have to justify why you care about privacy or you have to quantify how much you care about privacy. And so my starting point in thinking about privacy policy is consumers do value privacy, many of them to some extent. It's often hard to disentangle with surveys and, and uh, even sometimes with uh, behavior how much they value it. But I don't think we should be in the business, unless we have to be, of asking why and how much. Rather. Uh, we should be in the business of saying this is what consumers want. Let's try to make sure that the system is not set up to thwart them in their market-based search for what they want. And to economists, uh, one way to frame this is what's on the slide. Can privacy be just another good? Can we apply consumer sovereignty to privacy as we do to uh, most other goods in the economy? And if you can, then the notice and choice framework starts to seem like if it can be implemented properly, if it can work well, the most natural framework for thinking about privacy. Okay? You tell consumers what they're getting, you tell consumers what they're giving, and they can make up their own minds about whether they want to do that. That's a technique that um, doesn't work perfectly, and I'm going to describe in some ways how it works particularly imperfectly with privacy. But nevertheless, it's the mainstream way in which we organize the provision of goods and uh, transactions in this economy, and I don't think we should abandon it just because there are some problems. I think we should work on fixing the problems and then see if we can uh, repair some of the defects that remain. So among the advantages, I think I've already said this really, minimizes the need to evaluate whether and why and how much consumers value privacy. It enables you to deal with the information, uh, excuse me, the innovation uh, uh, rhetorical line or genuine question, whichever it is, and it's probably both. 
Okay? Uh, it enables you to address the diversity of preferences and diversity of technologies. It enables you to set up competition on privacy and on privacy policies. It does all these things in much the same way as they get done without a lot of comment in most of the rest of the economy. <clears throat> um, okay, but it is difficult. And so I don't think notice and choice is a simple one-line answer to privacy policy. Let me make that clear. Okay? It's difficult because it's not easy to know what you want or should want. Even the experts can't entirely predict what will be feasible, especially in the future, uh, what will be profitable, what will be likely, or what will be harmful by way of reuse of consumer information. Okay? Also, it's not a straightforward evaluation of a single transaction because the effects of telling person A about topic X interact with the effects of per telling person B about topic Y. Depends on do they share this information, do they put it together with topic Z, um, and that's a very opaque process and leads to very opaque results. Opaque to everybody, including the experts, but perhaps especially to consumers. Okay, so that makes it really quite hard. Um, it's also hard in a way that should be a natural um, uh, way to think for the uh, lawyers in the room. Uh, there are contracting issues. In order to have efficient contracting, which is the foundation of the general consumer sovereignty approach to uh, consumer welfare, um, you need to be able to describe what's being traded you need to be able to make a commitment, an enforceable commitment, to doing X and not doing Y. Okay? And an additional contract uh, issue, which is not unique to this circumstance, um, but is perhaps particularly uh, uh, salient here, is that it would be really nice if we can, maybe more than that, to be able to deal with serendipity, by which I mean Here's some data you're giving me. It might be good if I can hang on to it for a while and see whether some valuable use crops up that you might really approve of my making. Okay? And I said that last bit about the approve. That's, of course, really important. Um, it's not easy to contract for that, given that talking about it later is going to involve high transaction costs. And in addition to high transaction costs for asking, even higher transaction costs for making a further payment. So the pricing is going to find it very difficult to respond to this ex post renegotiation. And as I'm going to describe uh, in perhaps tedious detail, it is actually important whether pricing can respond or not. Okay, so what I'm going to do, this is my, uh, the component of the talk where uh, I give vent to the hardcore economic analysis. I'm going to describe for you how a standard pricing uh, market mechanism with rational but not necessarily fully informed consumers can sometimes lead to efficient policies. Okay? If you like, uh, this is elucidating the Coase theorem view of things. Uh, and somebody mentioned an article by Elaine Noam, which I haven't read, I'm sorry to say, but um, it sounded as if he might be uh, working along the same lines uh, as this. <clears throat> uh, let me be very clear that in elucidating this argument, I don't mean to be adopting it. But I also don't mean to be saying that it's complete nonsense. And I'll talk a little bit more about that after I've told you what the argument is. The conditions, technically, for the argument to hold are quite demanding. So if you're going to quote theorems and try to argue that way, it's like saying if a whole bunch of unrealistic conditions held, then so and so. And you might say, as a matter of formal logic, people would say, well, okay, that's uh, not very interesting because we know that that whole bunch of unrealistic conditions is collectively unrealistic. So what are you bothering to say that for? As, I, as I'll try to explain very briefly, that's actually not the right way to read an economic model. And I think a lot of people don't know how to read an economic model, so I'll try to give you the one 
minute tutorial in that deep topic. Okay. Uh, let me leave that. Okay. I'm going to be talking about how well a particularly simple incentive institution works. So I'm not going to be talking, for example, about trusted intermediaries. Somebody in the panel was stressing, I think correctly, and I'll come back to this later, that that might be very important. Um, I'm not going to be talking about liability rules or voluntary liability agreements, which I think could be very important, and which, of course, are the basis for the harm model that we've heard a little bit about. Um, I already talked very briefly in a slightly dismissive way about the possibility of renegotiation uh, ex post when potential uses actually crop up. So I'm going to be focusing on one relatively narrow but not by any means insignificant issue, uh, the direct profit motive in contracting on how information might be reused at the time when the original transaction is taking place. So in order to do that, I think it's helpful to give uh, one of, no doubt, thousands of possible taxonomies of consumer data uses. Um, one is what uh, in the FTC's draft framework report was called, I think, uh, order fulfillment. So if you order a book from Amazon, and you happen to know already, let's say, that Amazon ships by UPS, it won't surprise you or perturb you that Amazon will pass on your address information to UPS. Okay? Now, the reason that that's kind of in a category, uh, in a particularly unworrying category, seems to me to be it is about directly serving the transaction that you initiated and you want. Okay? In the draft framework, the uh, language commonly accepted was used. I actually think uh, that's not the best language, and uh, I think it's misled some people, so I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, but that's one category of data use which I think is thoroughly unthreatening, and um, uh, as the draft report suggested, we should really strip away before we get into anything that's going to lead to transaction costs and possible trouble. And then there's a category of profitable reuses of the information, that the consumer, not necessarily, but may well not directly want to happen. And when I say directly, I mean aside from getting money or stuff. Okay? And it's very important, I think, to subdivide this category between those uses where the consumer does want that use to be made <laughs> when you take it. To I'm sure there must, there must be a good line that professional speakers... <laughs> All right, I'll start that again. Um, it's important, I think, to subdivide this reuse category into those that the consumer might not like in themselves but would be happy to agree to in return for the free content or the reduction in price or some other benefit that is going to be given in, in return for it versus the ones that, no, the terms that will be offered, will be provided, are actually not acceptable to the consumer if he focused on it. Okay? And what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be looking to see how well negotiation at the time of the initial purchase is going to deal with that division between the valid reuses and the invalid reuses, you might say, or the efficient and inefficient, or the um, beneficial and harmful. Because it seems to me that's a very important question for privacy policy to the extent that privacy policy is about controlling but not killing information reuse. Okay. So, um, all right, so I'm going to do this with an example. This is my concession to the non-economists in the room. No Greek letters. I'm going to be thinking about a particular prospective reuse of consumer data that would do two things. It would yield 
$3 per customer in follow-on revenues. Actually, most of these are orders of magnitude smaller than that, but um, I had a dollar key on my keyboard. I didn't have a cent key on my keyboard. When did that disappear? Um, so it would yield $3 in follow-on revenues to the data uh, acquirer, whether directly as a first party or through a third party, doesn't matter in itself, although that question might be correlated with the ability to find lots and lots of these things and use them in a uh, very vigorous kind of way. And in addition, it would harm or annoy or upset customers to the tune of $4. So we're dealing here with one that's apt to be harmful okay, because if the uh, data user had to compensate the customers for this, he'd have to pay them $4 and then it's not worth it. Okay? So this is one where we want the answer to be no and the question is what's the mechanism, if any, whereby the answer will be no? Because if you just had uh, what I will perhaps unfairly call laissez-faire, then when this opportunity comes along, the data uh, acquiring firm looks at the $3 and says, I'd rather have $3 than nothing, and goes ahead and does it. Okay? So what are the mechanisms to stop that from happening? Because we do want, it to, st we do want to stop it happening uh, in this instance. Okay? Will it be profitable to make this use? It will be ex post. Okay? But in certain cases, it won't be if there's some kind of negotiation and commitment being made at the time of the original transaction. Okay? And I want to take you through the analytics because A, they're very cool, actually, and B, uh, not everybody understands them, I think, very well, and C, it lets us get to some questions of expectations and disclosures that I think are actually pretty central. Okay. So first of all, first observation is from a business point of view, the prospect of being able to get this $3 per customer in follow-on revenues has the same impact on business decisions. Do I want to be in this business? How do I want to price the initial purchase? How many do I want to, uh, how many customers do I want to deal with? The same impact as a $3 per customer reduction in costs. Why? Because the business is thinking about the price it gets in the transaction, the cost it has to pay to, to process the transaction, and whatever follow-on revenues. And if you think about it, the follow-on revenues can be thought of either as just an increase in the price, or I'm going to say more illuminatingly, as a decrease in the production cost. Okay? So that's an observation that I hope you understand and accept. I don't expect that uh, you're interested in it yet. Second observation, if customers see clearly in the initial transaction whether or not this data reuse that we're looking at is going to be done or not, then planning to do it shifts the demand curve down by $4. Why? Well, because for each customer, having this data use in prospect is an annoyance or a harm or a uh, opposite of benefit of $4. And so if you were willing to pay $27.30 for the transaction before, you'll only be willing to pay $23.30 for it now. So the entire demand curve is shifted down by the $4. Okay? Surprisingly strong, I think, uh, implications follow from these observations. I'm going to analyze these shifts in two steps. So we've got two shifts, a shift in the costs and a shift in demand. Okay? And I'm going to break them down in a slightly different way. And it turns out um, that gives us some surprisingly strong implications. So we can think of the $3 downward shift in cost plus the $4 downward shift in demand in another way as a $4 downward shift in both followed by a $1 upward shift in costs alone. Okay? So down by 4, down by 4, up by 1. That's the same as down by 4, down by 3. 
So that's a legitimate, if baffling, way to rejigger the data that I've given you in the hypothetical. I'll use that word hypothetical to make the lawyers feel more comfortable. <laughs> So now let's analyze the effects of shifting both down by $4. Turns out that quite generally, no assumptions about competition, no assumptions about the shape of the cost curve, no assumptions about the shape of the demand curve. If you shift costs down by $4 and, <coughs> and the demand curve down by $4, the profit maximizing price will go down by the same $4. Okay? That's not a piece of economic analysis. It's almost more a tautology. It's not an obvious one, and I'm not going to take the time to take you through it. I just ask you to um, trust me on that. Um, it's closely related to, although not quite the same as, a celebrated result in the theory of public finance and taxation that it doesn't matter for the overall in influence of a, of a product tax whether the tax is ostensibly paid by the customer or by the firm. Okay? And so the result of the price, the cost, and the demand shifting down by $4 is you get the same quantity traded, you get the same profits, you get the same consumer welfare, you get the same everything as you did without the shift. Okay? So now what about the $1 shift? Well, just to remind you, we rearranged uh, the $4 harm to consumers and $3 gain to the firm into $4 downward shifts in both and then a $1 increase in costs. I told you, and I hope it sounded plausible, it is true, uh, that the $4 downward shifts in both netted out to a complete non-event. No change in profits, no change in consumer welfare, no change in quantity, no change in anything other than some accounting entries. Okay? So then the combination of the shifts amounts just to looking at the $1. And the $1 cost increase obviously hurts the firm. You don't like to have your costs increase by a dollar a unit. And almost certainly hurts consumers too. Because if you're trading with a firm, you don't like to have its costs go up because chances are they'll raise their price in response. Okay? And so, in the circumstances that I've been talking about, the firm's preferences and the consumer's preferences about whether or not to countenance this prospective reuse of this particular data are completely aligned. The conflict has been entirely neutralized by the very strong assumptions about contracting uh, and foresight that were built into the way I set the problem up. Okay? So was this a crazy model? <clears throat> I don't think it was. I think it's not a crazy model, even though some of its assumptions are inaccurate, okay? quite demanding and, and certainly inaccurate in, as, a, as a literal statement, because when you're trying to read an economic model, as I said, you'll always be able to find some, probably all, of the assumptions that are not strictly accurate. Okay? But the way to get insight out of these economic models is to trace through the logic and see how things are working. And how things are working here is... Um, that's not what I want to say. Um, how, things are, whoops, how things are working here is if the firm is going to reuse the consumer data in a way that's objectionable to consumers and they notice that fact, then the demand curve will come down and the amount that the demand curve comes down is exactly related to how much they care and that the amount that the demand curve comes down will be set against whatever short-run gains the firm might make uh, from the reuse of the data. So that's a relatively robust uh, set of statements that says this demand shifting effect is a key way, I think, certainly a potentially key way, in which firms may have an incentive, may, to act responsibly in their data reuse. Okay? All right. 
I now forget why I organized my slides like this, but I'm going to tell you, for those of you who are interested in antitrust, and I know some of you are, um, this is exactly analogous to thinking about the economics of aftermarkets. I, I won't take a long time on this because it's a little bit off topic, but in aftermarkets, uh, as for example, repairs to a durable product or spare parts or ink cartridges for printers, that seems to have been a very big one for some reason, um, what we want to know is what practices, and in particular what competitive conditions, are going to apply in the follow-on treatment of this consumer after they've... Really? I don't think so. Um, after they've uh, done this transaction, okay? And it's precisely analogous, and I'm getting cheated of my promised time, so I will skip ahead. <laughs> okay. It is really important for this model, and for aftermarkets, that whether or not the data reuse in, in question will be adopted is what economists call observable. Okay, and I want to make a very important point about that. Subtle but key point. That is different from saying consumers are not fooled in the end. There are two ways that consumers might be not fooled in the end. One is they can actually see whether or not you're going to do this. That counts. The other is they can't see whether or not you're going to do it. So, of course, you're going to do it because that gets you your three dollars. And eventually, consumers learn to be cynical and say, well, yeah, that three dollars is going to be irresistible. Of course, he's going to do it. That doesn't count. The difference is, if you chose not to do it, would they notice? Or are they facing a kind of learned cynicism that makes them correct in equilibrium, but not capable of noticing if you made the better choice? Those are very different things in game theory, and they're very different things in privacy policy. Um, so the saying, fool me twice, shame on me, doesn't really capture the full harms that come about from being fooled twice. Okay? If I'm fooled twice, then perhaps I ought to come to expect that I can't trust your promises. But it's not like that means everything is okay. On the contrary, it means that you can't effectively make promises to me, so a whole bunch of perhaps mutually beneficial trades become impossible. Okay? So the Scott Mc McNeely quip that there is no privacy, get over it, is a bad privacy policy. If Scott went around and vigorously educated all consumers that there is no privacy and they should get over it, and if that were our privacy policy, it would likely turn out that there would be no privacy and that consumers expected that and that they were not fooled, that would not be a good outcome. Okay? So it's really important to stress that not being wrong, not being deceived in that active sense is not a sufficient condition for things to work right. Okay? This is actually a pretty general point that um, I like to stress in thinking about both competition policy and consumer protection policy. Um, when I was younger, I used to have um, Achilles tendonitis quite a lot, and my doctor told me that if you have acute Achilles tendonitis too much, you get something that's related but different called chronic Achilles tendonitis. And there's a similar thing that happens in these areas of policy. Okay? If you think about deceptive pricing or fraud, if you defraud a consumer often enough, they'll learn not to trust you. That's not okay. That leads to a different kind of harm than the ones that happened the first couple of times when the consumer was still getting fooled, but it's still a harm. And it's a harm that I think the case-based, litigation-based enforcement system finds harder to deal with. There was a question from the audience about doesn't the FTC's enforcement authority to go after deception and lies uh, resolve the problem? Well, it resolves the acute problem. It doesn't resolve the chronic problem. Um, okay, back to privacy. So it's pretty hard to do this. Um, even if it's pretty hard to effectively disclose what you're going to do with, uh, by way of reusing data. Okay? Teaching is hard, even when both teacher and student are really trying. Okay? And it's obviously even harder 
if one or both parties are not wholehearted in trying. Okay? So what we call disclosures are often circumstances where somebody wants to be able to say that they tried to communicate something, but they don't really want to communicate it. Okay? They'd like to be able to say afterwards that they disclosed it, but they don't really want you to know it. And that's a big difference. We do have a wide range of very effective disclosures in our economy. We call them ads. Okay? When you really want to communicate something to the consumer, you may, you may figure it's hard to get the consumer to pay attention, but you don't just say, so probably they won't. You work on it, and you make it happen. Okay? And so, uh, oh, there's way too much to say in, in my negative uh, time, but, all right, thank you. So, if you consult your notes later, you will realize that the $4 change in price when both demand and costs went down by $4 was crucial to the argument. So if you have rigid pricing where the price will not adjust, then it turns out that the impact on the firm is more complex and the impact on consumers is apt to be more adverse. Okay? It's often suggested that um, we do have rigid pricing in the world of internet content for consumers. Okay, zero is a particularly attractive price for a whole bunch of transaction cost type reasons. And however valid those reasons are, it means that the repricing argument um, isn't going to work nearly as well as you might think. Okay? Um, let me skip over this. How flexible is pricing? That depends on a couple of things. One is whether a provider, or at least a group of competing providers collectively, can really provide different pricing for consumers who offer different amounts by way of valuable data. Okay? Sometimes that can work well, sometimes it can't work well at all. It's quite important, especially if the pricing on individual contracts is somewhat sticky. A second thing that's often uh, understressed, I think, is that if there are other ways to pay for content that work well, then we don't have to be in the trap of thinking protecting privacy might threaten free content. Okay? And we saw this play out in the TV market. It used to be that in TV, uh, the only way that content providers could be uh, paid for the content they were providing was through forcing you to watch ads. Okay, and that led to a whole bunch of inefficiencies, ranging from people having to watch ads to the uh, industry attempting to shut down the VCR industry. Um, once we had subscription television, there arose an option that I have to say surprises me how little it's used, but nevertheless the option is there, to pay for commercial free programming. Okay, and so the potentially inefficient way of charging uh, can go away. There are some paradoxes of micropayments, though, in that most of the kinds of ways we could do micropayments might involve the micropayment company tracking what you do. Do you trust them? Why? <laughs> How does that work? All right, let me skip ahead. I do have some, uh, some slides on approach. I will try to be very brief. There are fearsome challenges in notice and choice, but I do think it should play a key role in privacy policy partly because it enables you to get around the why on earth do we want privacy type questions. Um, to make that work reasonably well, we have to think a lot about incentives to make it well, work well, not just rules that say it has to. Because incentives, by and large, work better than rules. Okay. It is important also to remove clutter, as the draft privacy framework uh, suggested. Um, I don't think commonly accepted is the right phrase uh, because of the issue that I talked about with um, fool me twice. Um, we do have to recognize, as with safety, as with medical consent, as with a whole bunch of other areas where notice and choice won't be enough, and we want to consider other approaches as well. Okay? And two that have been particularly prominent uh, in the legal literature on behavior in general, and I think in privacy, one is liability type rules. 
that does require some ability to quantify harm. It doesn't have to be tangible harm. We sometimes can be good at quantifying soft harms, but not always. Um, and conduct rules. Having some conduct rules means that the notice and choice and the liability frameworks don't have to carry as much weight, and that can help them, I think, perform better. Um, finally, we should recognize that these are very hard problems, and we should continue to learn and to improve the policies, not regard ourselves as having arrived at, at the right answer, partly because they're really hard, and so it'll take us a long time, even if the problem kept still, and partly because, as somebody on the panel was saying, the problem won't keep still. And finally, I think we should be very open to private law type solutions, trusted intermediaries, trustworthy intermediaries, uh, voluntary adoption of liability type commitments. Um, and one idea for enforcement is that enforcing those promises may be a more high powered way to uh, make sure the market uh, does, has its best shot at working well than uh, enforcing the probably much larger number of uh, end user uh, uh, facing. All right, well, um, I know Paul thinks I went over my time. I dispute that, um, but I realize I'm keeping you from lunch, so. Thank you.